This is Jack Donovan, and you're watching PH2T3R, Patera, the Journal of Solar Culture. And tonight, I'm joined, of course, with my normal co-host, uh, C.B. Robertson, author of many fine books, and now a journeyman electrician, uh, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> I think I'm more excited than you. But, <laughs> but uh, no, I'm, I'm really excited about that. Congratulations on that, man. And, uh, and so, so tonight, we're going to talk about um, creativity. We were, we were kind of uh, trying to figure out what we wanted to talk about. And last episode, we talked about uh, Christopher's essay in um, the new but their book, uh, or the print version of the show. And part of the idea of that is uh, postmodernism and how do we get out? Uh, where, how do we get out of this postmodern mindset? And you know, what is beyond that? And the question then is raised is what does creativity look like in the post postmodern age? Uh, as we move out of this kind of cynical, you know, death of all meta narratives uh, mindset, where nothing is real, nothing matters, and everything is a is a hipster joke about a joke and a joke and a joke. Um, I was thinking about this as we started the, talking about having the show, and. Uh, I was thinking about it's like Superman versus Deadpool. Like if you've ever watched Deadpool uh, as a comic as a comic book hero, um, he is com all jokes all the time. Jokes and jokes and jokes and jokes. Everything is kind of crass that he does. Like it's a very crass character. And then the, the complete opposite would be Superman, who is very sincere. Uh, and tormented and like, you know, like this sincere character. And that's, I think one of the things that happens is uh, one of the struggles that I've had in, you know, observing art is that we've been raised in this age where we expect everything to be kind of cynical and to have a little bit of like wink, wink, nod, nod in the background. Like we're not really that serious about it and really good art really isn't that i mean you can you can make art that's clever and it, it makes me whenever i say clever it makes me think of the fight club sequence on the plane like oh clever how's that working out for you uh but uh there's you know it's one thing to be clever and it's another thing to be sincere and to make really beautiful things i think you have to be sincere well and the reason that fight club sticks is because it is absolutely permeated with sincerity beneath that veneer of like postmodern uh cynicism you know, right like, it's a very postmodern film if i think about it you know like in the way that it, there's so many like little like easter eggs and like uh i mean it's a brilliant film but uh yeah. all these little things woven together and it, there's a lot of snark mixed in and uh but there's also it's a search for authenticity right it's exactly like, and and it takes that search very seriously you know like the it, it is it is ridiculous in a lot of ways, but the, like the search isn't given up on on account of the ridiculousity, um, which is I think what what redeems it over a character like Deadpool who just leans into the absurdity and it may it, in a very I think it's kind of a gross way it makes all of the killing that he does also into kind of a joke. Like, it's funny when he blows someone's head off. Like, it's especially funny when he would, if he does it by accident. You know, I, I haven't seen the Deadpool movies. I've seen enough of the clips to not have any interest in it. Um, but, like, oh, it's funny. Um, and, and another movie that came out, I believe, around the same time as Fight Club, which also has this, it's in some ways postmodern but at a very deep level is anti-postmodern is uh, Boondock Saints. Okay. Which uh, like the, the way that, um, you know, the FBI agent who's played by, gosh, what's his name? Willem Dafoe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, walking through and explaining things with his music, doing his finger guns as the guys are shooting. And, yeah. and all that. It, it has a kind of postmodern breaking the fourth wall kind of feel to it. But what it's describing is very anti-absurdist. It's um, like moral realism in a very direct way. Um, 
and it brings the postmodernism kind of back in at the end as a question mark with all these people giving their different takes on saints. But um, using the postmodern uh, artistic repertoire to advance very anti postmodern moral and aesthetic ideas feels like a very interesting expression of creativity um, in terms of not of of working within working within the constraints to push beyond what the constraints seem to limit you to if that makes sense yeah to make a sincere point i mean obviously there's the stylistic things uh that are very postmodern. uh mm -hmm. there's all, like, you know and we are hemmed in by them just because of attention spans to a certain extent and uh and the style of things that you know, styles style is a different thing but we, if the style comes from postmodernism, it's still part of our reference uh, right. things. I mean, like a Guy Ritchie film has a very postmodern style, you know, like a, a quick clips and da da, da 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 like here's a oh surprise, you know, like uh, uh, the way it's put together. But uh, that doesn't mean you know there's nothing sincere uh, inside of it, um, right? And that's 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 the big I think you you can do that. And create something sincere but i think it, that it has to be sincere i mean i was you know if i look at uh, you know pop music and um it, if you look at what pop music was i mean a pop music always bothers me because it's always about people falling in love that's like 90 percent of pop music is like relationship drama <laughs> and it, it's kind of tiresome in that way <laughs> like but uh uh if, if you look at something like you know Sinatra or Dean Martin, uh, or any of those songs really before, like say the 1970s, um, and really well into after that, there were sincere pop songs. I mean, that's one of the things that like was really I think up until maybe the 90s that you really didn't have a lot of songs that were sincere anymore, and everybody was everything was like a remix and a collaboration and uh, yeah, and talking over each other and and uh, other stuff like that. But it, I mean, you really had songwriting up to that point but the songs were cliches i've read books on songwriting because i was trying to do that for a while in my myth, misguided youth and uh, there's formulas to it and and it's like there are things that you say that there are cliches but that's why they work yeah you know i can't think of one off the top of my head but like oh oh i think one of them is that it, it, you know you wrote a real pop song if the word fool isn't it like if you, if you were a fool or like something like like they, there was a lot of foolishness in like in like uh pop songs in uh that, that was one of the big cliches that was you know used a lot there, there's a funny example of this use of cliches in um not a beatles song but a paul mccartney song um silly love song so you, you i'm sure you're familiar yeah, yeah, sure. with that it, it's the it is a very much breaking fourth wall um I love you. That there's like no more cliche line in all of music than right. I love you. Um, but he's doing it in a in the most like like shit eating grin, passive aggressive way at his former bandmate, John Lennon, who was going down his commie rabbit hole and was complaining about uh people writing silly love songs. Right. And so he he turns around. And makes a song that's not a silly love song, but is about silly love songs, and and the and the sincere love the, the it, it's it is on the one hand a silly song, and right. it's an unserious song, but it's it's expressing love for something that is serious and that is real. He's like you're you're just missing something very important here, and it's a and it uses all of the power of cliches and formulaic songwriting in an unserious way to express a serious point, um, which is, uh, I mean, uh, the, I was, I was trying to think about creativity, um, you know, with the family on the drive back uh, a few hours ago and every single good instance of, of creativity in my own experience or someone else's uh, I could think of was essentially about problem solving. Like how do I, make something original or how do i how do i solve a problem that is hard and in in art and in music oftentimes that's how do i make something that feels original despite being constrained by all these things that 
are conspiring to make it sound trite and old and cliche and um creativity seems to be just the art and knack of drawing connections between unlike things in order to solve problems whether that's making a a catchy song or getting a business to run properly or or whatever the case may be yeah i mean i definitely think that's the case uh what you're doing with creativity and this is why i've joked a little bit about ai is that i mean ai doesn't work so differently than we do is to, as artists um i mean there are certain things that we can do that it can't but uh there's also i mean as an artist i'm basically uh if i want something like i'm trying to design t-shirts this month or or and if i don't design them i'll pay someone to do it and that's really like using ai because i'm going to give them <laughs> prompts i'm going to give them props my way i want this 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 and this i want it in this style and this you know like that's that is basically like using ai do, do we have room for a for a two minute digression because there was probably the funniest news story i've ever heard uh came out yesterday or today okay um you might have heard of the amazon walkout store the store where you can just walk in grab things and just walk out and they have this camera system that okay. would track your movements and then bill you later be like wow this is very sophisticated technology um that it can track you and and uh charge you based on just what you take you just walk in take what you want walk out and you receive the bill digitally yeah apparently it came out recently that the sophisticated technology which preceded chat gpt and all this ai stuff their highly sophisticated digital tracking technology was a team of profoundly underplay, underpaid Indians uh, in in India watching the cameras and writing things down. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was their super sophisticated tracking system. That that that's AI for you. <laughs> so wow, I, I it was, wow. I that was a very symbolic uh, and illustrative like. If you put that in a story, that, that could be a part of a Chuck Palahniuk novel. Right there. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But I mean, basically, as an artist, what I'm going to do is that's how I learn. That's how you learn to make art. Like you learn to you, you're like, well, I like this style. Let me try to make something like this style. And then eventually, you know, it's like they always say with anything that you're learning, you learn the rules and then you learn to improvise. Um, you're you're or your improvisation is your inability to do that perfectly. To, yes. I mean, I can't, For I can look at somebody else's style, but I can't actually be them. So like, it's gonna come out different. So I can try to rip off their style. Um, and I'm pretty good at that actually with a lot of things. Like, I'm like, oh, I need something a little bit like this. Okay, I can get to there. Um, and I can pick up, okay, what well, kind of brush stroke he's using or whatever. And, um, you know, order the tools that he's using, all the stuff like that, figure it out. But I, can, I can't, can't be that guy. So yeah. what I'm going to make is going to be original anyway. Uh, right. And because I can't help it. And I think with uh, what you're talking about is about creativity and making something new. I mean, that's, uh, I've used it before. There's Ezra Pound is, I think, credited with uh, you know, a slogan for modernism called make it new. And, uh, as far as art is concerned and uh that that is a good motto uh because everything you know like they say everything has been said under the sun and everything that you know has been done but our frame of reference is different and so creativity in many cases is just um updating it with your frame of reference like uh, okay well based on my surroundings i'm perceiving it this way and i can add a little bit of this to it or a little bit of that to it uh, in the way that when you, we've probably talked about this before, when you pull up a classic story, there's a classic storyline there. And if you put it in the future, I think I brought it up before. There's a, there's this comic book that I have somewhere, uh, where, uh, they, they took the Hercules story and actually put it in like outer space and it was fucking brilliant. And, yeah. but it, because they're just taking this story that's eternal and that's really what art has to be it has to connect with something human that makes sense to a lot of people i don't think right. it can connect with everybody because we don't all like all art right but it has to be there has to be something real and authentic about it and, and, and really connect with other humans in, in a way otherwise you're just talking to yourself 
Uh, and that that's one of the things that I have problems with art. I'm like kind of a weirdo. And so I'm like, I'm like, well, uh, uh, what am I making like for the people? <laughs> you know, like, uh, and I have to like uh, really ratchet down sometimes because where I want to go is not where they're at. You know, like uh, I, I might have one style, but that doesn't appeal to my, my, necessarily my audience. And so I have to like meet them halfway and try yeah. and get them there. I mean, a lot of the stuff we're doing with solar idealism, like, we're going to talk about, we're going to have a, uh, you know, mid-century modern updated futuristic aesthetic and you're going to like it. Uh, yeah. I mean, I impose that on because that's my vibe. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, uh, so like that's, but you have to edge people into that, you know, like, because that's yeah. like, what is this? But it's, it's, it's hard because there's this great um, David Foster Wallace essay called E Unibus Plurum. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think I first heard mentioned um, from you, although you were referencing a salon article that referenced it uh, mm -hmm. about how um, insincerity was killing our culture. And, and David Foster Wallace was the one who was advancing this back in the nineties. And he had this line in that essay where he says, he was talking about television, the most of the essays about television and how it's a low art, but it's not a low art because the audience is stupid. It's a low art because the audience is large and people tend to be high and refined and moral and excellent in really, really niche weird things, but we're common in the things that we find like stupid and like in our lowbrow humor where we, we share physical comedy in common, you know? Um, and so things that achieve an audience of a sufficiently large scale size kind of, have to bring down the quality to the lowest common denominator because not everyone has developed the same aesthetic kind of feeling um in in parallel tandem with each other yeah well and the other thing is that happened you know like in terms of creativity is everything is niche now mm -hmm. um i mean what we see is pop culture is one thing but in reality I think we miss a lot of really great culture that's being created right now oh, because yeah. it is so niche and you actually have to get into the niche. I mean, there are people writing beautiful songs everywhere right now. Um, I mean, if, if you go down in the rabbit holes of like different genres of music, um, I mean, uh, there's all kinds of people who like country, like uh, there's, there's not like the pop country that you see on the radio, but there's all kinds of country musicians that are writing like beautiful, like heartbreaking songs, like right now, and, or just good songs and, and stuff that you've never even heard of or artists that you've never even heard of because they might have an audience of maybe a hundred thousand, which is a huge audience, but also a tiny audience compared to like what is pop. Um, I mean, for a long time, they said as artists, you could make, a living and i don't know if this is exactly true anymore but like uh, you could make a living if you had a thousand people who buy everything that you do <laughs> you know like that was the idea is like you could call that was like an indie artist uh, uh vibe for a long time is like if you can cultivate these a few thousand people who really just like what you do then you you've you've got you've got like a career um and that's i don't know like i said if it's a, just a few thousand or maybe five but like uh you know, I think that's that there's something to that and you, you can't please everybody, but there's, you know, we used to have this monoculture where it's like, you know, like the 1970s, like <laughs> my grandma was wearing bell bottoms, you know, like uh, everybody was wearing bell bottoms in the seventies because it was a thing and it was and like, everyone was doing it. And uh, it wasn't just disco culture in New York city. You know, it, it broke out. Once it broke out, it broke really big, but we don't have those, we do have some trends, you know, like that are still big, but they're still pretty niche. You know, like uh, everybody talks about the broccoli head kids. Like, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that it's big enough that it's everywhere, you know. Well, it's big but, enough to be memed about, which is like what matters as far as what historians will remember as our culture, right? Right, right. But it's still pretty, pretty small. Yeah. You know, the amount of kids actually doing that is probably pretty small, but, but it's, uh, you know, it's big enough to be noticed. Uh, but maybe, maybe it's always been that way. I don't know. Uh, but uh, well, it, it seems it, like culture is a lot more fragmented. than and, and, and things can can grow and expand in weird ways. Like one of my favorite. So when I was in middle school, I was a bit of a nerd. 
and uh, one of the games that I played with friends was called it was a tabletop game called Warhammer 40k. Perhaps some people have heard of this. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's like nerds in the back are going, who? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well, almost, almost, almost nobody hasn't heard of it now, because almost everybody has heard the phrase "God Emperor." Now yes. they don't know where it came from. They don't know necessarily where it came from. It came from a tabletop game, mm-hmm. and this tabletop game took off not only because the game itself was fun. I was involved for the strategy side. I had other friends who were involved for the art side. Other friends who were involved for the lore side, but it had all of these elements to it and the design of some of the models were fin actually i have one right here this is i was messing around with a coworker, and this is a like a, a chaos space marine model um, yeah. but anyways like you, so you would design these models and paint them and you create armies but there were these just just books and books and books of lore about these different civilizations, these different races, who are the Tyranids, who are the Necrons. And it worked its way into politics. Someone latched on to the imagery, this like dark Christian crusader with like skulls defending the Imperium against the hive mind kind of thing. And they appropriated that for, you know, uh, to talk about a a certain politician. Um, Now, most of the people employing those memes have never been in a room with six other, you know, sweaty, overweight nerds with their, like, in a games workshop somewhere, uh, arguing over, like, movement rules with, like, this, like, gene stealer squad or whatever the fuck. But, like, the, the, the way that that transforms over time and, like, what gets picked up and what gets left behind in the transmission of cultural memes forward um is kind of its own process and so like the brock the the fact that the broccoli head kids aren't actually that prevalent might not be relevant if if the the large cultural impact is the memes that that we see on reddit or instagram or whatever that arrive from that uh (laughs) the the platonic form of the broccoli headed kid at the gym yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's that is the way that culture moves is that you can put something out there and then it trickles out into something, becomes something else. You can't control it once that happens. It, beca- it takes on a life of its own. Right. I mean, I feel like I've put a few little memes out there that it, that have like gotten a life of their own and whatever, uh, or influenced things in some way. And uh, yeah, they just that's that happens. That's how, and that's yeah, it's uh, that's how that's how smaller voices actually do percolate out in that way you know they get picked up there's some nerd who's an intern i mean you know that probably happened because there's some nerd who's an intern at, at uh you know the white house uh you know like uh, that who's played warhammer uh or you know so there's something else like that i mean i know a lot of people who uh, uh were working some like sketchy stuff into like things because they were interns in places um and uh and some of it good and some of it not so good uh but and, and probably on both sides, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of that everywhere. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, that is how things trickle out. And one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about creativity too is that this is a, ba- uh, a drum that I've been banging for several years now. And I wrote an essay about it uh, in terms of uh, that men don't really feel like they have permission to make culture or care about art. And I brought this up in our Discord group uh, because I wanted to, I, I was just like, t- pick a piece of art from the past hundred years that you think is good and, and, and put it up and, pe- and say, why, you know, like, and, uh, and all the guys, I mean, and I, I told you that this was going to happen, but most of it, most of it was fantasy artwork, uh, you know, for, which is not bad. I like that stuff too. It's around my house. Uh, and like I have presenters everywhere. Uh, but, uh, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> against it. Uh, but, uh, most of it was fantasy artwork. And then they were reaching back. They, they couldn't hit the hundred years. They were going back more than a hundred years constantly. And like men have been taught that anything new in terms of art is bad. And that also art is not something that's for them. And also they don't even necessarily think about what art includes. They think about paintings in a museum that they've heard about that are stupid 
and that their kids, you know, a three-year-old could do them, et cetera, et cetera. And they kind of like dismissed it. Mm -hmm. and, and also they related to, uh, you know, politics that are not within their realm. And one of the points I, I was thinking about about this is that I think is interesting is that the same is true of music. Um, it, any music, 90% of the music you like is probably made by someone with the exact opposite politics of you. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, yeah. commies make good songs. <laughs> you know, like yeah. that's, I mean, there's so much of it. I mean, I was, when I went to the Turning Point uh, event, I'm like, they, they don't have enough like music that's of their kind that's also fun uh to play they're playing madonna at the at the turning point i'm like do you does any does anyone see that this is this is off this is all everything that you're against that you say that you're against is like this but uh i mean and that's common because that is the that is the common culture and if you like to have fun there's certain things that everybody knows and that but they're made by uh people who have totally different views and and 90 percent of just in the way that uh hollywood i mean you it's best I, I have managed to avoid and hopefully he's managed to speak about, but I've managed to avoid. I don't ever, ever want to hear what Hans Zimmer has to say about anything political because I don't need that information. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, uh, <laughs> he wrote the soundtrack to my entire yeah. life and I don't need that information because yeah. I know it's bad. I, well, I, like, I we would never, bad. we would never judge you know, Rand Paul's competence as a person based on his musical talents. Right. You know, so like, uh, like uh, now as it happens, I actually know a little bit about one of my favorite musicians, Maynard James Keenan. And like, he's, he's the worst. <laughs> well, well, on some things, but not on others. Right, like, right. like he has, he has some interesting positive takes and he's like, He's like a leftist for, I, I, I still disagree with a lot of his stuff, but he's like, he's at least got some interesting ideas okay, and some original ideas. And like, he, he takes a lot of his stuff back to the connection with our need to survive and to survive on our own. Uh, but, but also like with other people, but it's this, it's this sur like survival instincts orientation that you see that is like, that that's a completely different foundation than what a lot of the like the the npc progressive like archetype is operating from right um it, it still takes him to some absolutely silly gender places which is just i don't know it might just be him trolling too uh but uh, there, there's plenty of musicians like i if i cared about their politics you know system of a down and rage against the machine would be uh you know just unlistenable I mean, yeah, the, the Rage Against the Machine is actually a bridge too far for me. I can't, yeah. I can't, I can't like them anymore because <laughs> they're too ridiculous. But well, like, uh, what's cool is, I, I, in my humble opinion, yeah, if you take out the commie singer and put in the orthodox Christian singer, uh -huh. it actually does take it up like a notch. Okay. Um, that's just audio slave. Uh, just yeah, take yeah. out the Zach Delarocha, put in Chris Cornell, and it's uh, it's automatically like you know, twenty percent better. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of, uh, yeah, but yeah, like I said, so most musicians and most actors, uh, you don't really want to know what they they're just going to ruin it for you if they open them up, <laughs> um, because they aren't they're they're acting, uh, you know, and uh, musicians are like uh, talking about something else uh, when they're writing, and so, but we don't give that to art. Uh, we don't give that to visual art. Like men don't give that kind of birth to visual art. They're like They're made by a bunch of commies, and it's like done. <laughs> like the discussion is over, uh, and uh, it's interesting. I mean, it's an interesting like angle because, I mean, there's a lot of art that I would argue is very masculine, and that is cool. Uh, just because I you know went to art school and I went to a lot of art galleries and know a lot about art. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I've seen that I'm like, this, this is really great. And you don't even know that it exists because you're, that's, you, you're like not available for that realm mm -hmm. because you think that it's not for you. And that's, that's very true of men. And I think that, you know, that's, again, if you don't 
create culture, then someone else is going to do it for you. And then you can complain about the culture that create, but they're going to project all of their insecurities and all of their like little fixations and all of their little resentment things. They're going to pro project them to culture. And that's the culture that we have right. in the broad American. We, we have this kind of culture of resentment and, and all these little uh, kind of uh, minority or, you know, like daddy issues kind of things are projected on cultures because the guys who are not that way don't make culture. And that's the, that's a huge problem. And yeah. it's going to take a long time to fix that just worldwide. It's it's um, like, a, you know, military guys talk about the OODA loop, yes. which is, is a way of framing which side in a conflict is being proactive and which side is caught being reactive, essentially. And I feel like there's something, there's like an almost similar dynamic going on with expressions of identity and ideals and um, notions of good and bad in society. Cause, cause art is like, art is not the only expression of creativity, obviously, but it's like we, we use creativity to express ourselves in these things through art. Art is one means of, of doing that. And when art is, you know, art in, in all of its breadth is is uh, conceptualized as being a left-wing thing or an inherently left-wing thing and um, never mind someone like Yukio Mishima or who's that Spanish writer um, I forget uh, th there's a number of, of like excellent uh, you know right-wing novelists just as there are excellent left-wing novelists it's not well, and also person. everyone before that Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. like yeah. all of culture before that. I mean, like uh, when you get into the left wing or right wing, I mean, you're, you're talking about like 1900s forward. Uh, and if you go back beyond that, then you have a very different uh, perspective on all that. You have, you know, yeah. uh, mo most of the culture was like uh, half the symphonies are written for God. You know, like uh, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, including like my favorite. I mean, like uh, Song Song Symphony number three for organ. Um, needs to be played in a giant church with a giant organ because it's so fucking dope. Uh, <laughs> but, and let alone all right. the statues that everyone loves to put as their profile picture. And, oh, yeah. You know, like all the, yeah. all the, the uh, yeah, the, the, the statues are particularly visually compelling um, in many ways. There's a, a, a channel, an excellent, excellent YouTube channel called The Veltgeist, which is like, like 70% Nietzsche and like 20% Schopenhauer and uh, Freud and some other stuff. But it, he did a whole video just on one statue and talking about all these different uh, art historians take on this one statue is a man. I forget the name of the man. I watched the whole video and I don't remember, but it's the, the man who's being strangled by the snake mm -hmm. and it's him and his sons. And what's so striking about it is the, the anatomical detail is so precise that you can actually see pain on his body, yeah. but not on his expression. Why is I don't his... know how to pronounce it. Is the, is the L-A-C-O-O-N? Uh, it's something like that. Uh, it, I'll, it, I'll look I it up. I, I think I know what you're talking about. It's three yeah. guys and snakes just wrapping around them. It's yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Strangled by a snake, uh, by the python, Luck, Luck, Luck Holm and his sons. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's like his body is in pain, right. but his face is not. Why is his face not showing pain? And all these different artists, have, uh, art historians have these different ideas, but it's this like this big visual aesthetic mystery that like drew all of these famous like philosophers and stuff into this debate about this statue it's a very worthwhile video and and a worthwhile statue to look at uh, and again the, the channel that has this video is called veltgeist w h e l t um g e i s t but um like like that's um that's that's a very masculine statue with a, a masculine idea attached to it and um it, it's the sort of thing that uh lends itself to um, 
Well, to, to drawing your attention, I suppose. And I mean, that's that's half the, the I don't want to say the battle because art isn't necessarily about like beating someone else. But I mean, it is in a way about like what what things are worthy of our attention. Because it feels like whenever we make a, a piece of art or create something, there's a tacit assertion that this thing is worth looking at or worth, this poem is worth reading or hearing. This piece of music is worth listening to. Why is it worth listening to? Um, well, and then you get in this whole debate that's the, like the whole debate of the art world, which is like, who are the tastemakers? And uh, who and right. what is an object art? And like, what it, what is uh, like art, you know, the idea of is arts, but they, like there's a very modernist kind of anti that like we should just keep these things in museums forever. Like, oh, this is what this is what's important, uh, you know. And, and which I mean, I I like museums, uh, but uh, I I wouldn't uh, do anything to museums at all. But uh, there is a certain thing, especially and now as you get into this debate, which I, I won't go too in, far into because I don't really know that much about it, but it does seem plausible that a lot of the art world is really just money laundering. Uh, you know, yeah. that's going on right now. I mean, a, a lot of this stuff that you're like, why does anyone pay for this? And what is it? And whatever. And it's just like a way to have money exchange hands. And why is it worth that much? And, and all that kind of stuff. That, that, that's like a different tangential discussion. And you have to like produce evidence and whatever of that. But uh, uh, it, 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 there is a certain bit of that. Like, is this just bullshit that someone's making up? This is expensive because someone wanted to, to make some fucking cash. You know, like, is this important, really? You know, uh, and then you have all these art school, school people. Their job is to validate that, and 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 talk. I mean, I, I went to art school. Like, I <laughs> I developed that skill. You know, like, here's, you know, put put a pe dot of ink on the wall, and then just write why it's important. And basically, and you can just make shit up. I mean, you got you and I are both smart guys. We can come up with philosophical reasons why a dot on the wall is important. You know, it, it's just it's just a game, uh, and so a lot of people just become very good at that game. You know, like a, you know, make it make it about oppression or something. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, you can just throw that in there and people will eat it up. And uh, that that was a lot of the art world for a long time. Right. You you make it make it real fun by making the title meta. You do the dot on the wall, and then you the title is the oppression of the financial incentives that undermine art. Nice. That see, the, your, <laughs> a, a right, a plus right there. Uh, you know, like uh, <laughs> that. That is the, like the, the the best part of doing that. It's a it's a game, uh, but yeah, it, it's it's it, it's a it's a funny thing to do. But but I mean that's and that's and people see that it's a game, and that's why they don't like conceptual art, and that's why they don't like certain kinds of art because yeah. they see that there's a game being played and that it's that's nonsense. Uh, but then again, you can do things that aren't nonsense. Uh, you know, and and do something things that are very poetic with conceptual art. I I like it. Speaking uh, of uh, yeah. that, Mad Poet sixty six says Alex Gray is a great modern artist, in my opinion. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. I I saw that down because I actually have the iPad on my desk here, so I, I saw it. And that is actually a great introduction. Are you familiar with Alex Gray? No, I'm not. Okay, um, I've brought him up the whole before. Uh, he does psychedelic art. Okay. I, he really has like, uh, like, if I could have all the time in the world to make solar culture as cool as I could possibly make it, oh, his, his trajectory has, would be a good has, start. He has tool cover art. Yeah. He has tool cover art. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, that? if you look him up, like you know, literally, they, they, it's this whole thing called Chapel of Sacred Mirrors, and they make some, basically the psychedelic religion. And, okay. and they, they actually have temples and things that you can walk through and the arts in there, but they're out there and they have their own glyphs and everything, like their own language that they've created out of it, all kinds of symbols. It, it's such a cool thing. The, the what's this? Is it, was it 10,000 days or lateralis? The, the, like, yeah, he's, he's the cover of, of is it, maybe it's 10,000 days. Yeah. He's the cover of 10,000 days. Okay. It's, it's, it's literal tool cover art. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He, I, again, he, yeah. He, he, yeah. If you go through his like Instagram or something or his website, there's so much content. They've made so much stuff. And there's other people working under basically in that genre that he's created. There's a whole bunch of people creating art and doing like performance art and kind of things that are all like intertwined with that. Uh, I mean, uh, 
countless fortunes are being made. Uh, you know, but uh, it's something to aspire to. And so, you know, it's a shame maybe that it's so related to drugs, but like uh, as far as far as I know, I don't know everything about it. I haven't like researched it in depth, but that, that seems like it's, it's kind of like about mushroom trips, but, but you know, that's not bad uh, necessarily. I think it's, it's worse. Interesting. you know, like, uh, <laughs> but I mean, but it, 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 whether they've used that to, to like talk about a higher idea, I don't really know. I assume that they have because mm -hmm. uh, that's why people would think it's deep. Right. Uh, you know, like, so you layer stuff, meaning onto that. And so they've created meaning in their own way. And it's a really, I think it, it, uh, I almost made this show about the future. Uh, I was going to be like, well, let's talk about futurism. Like, what do we want? Like, right. what do we, what do we dream for solar idealism? What do we well, imagine this coming into? And I, I've always thought that that was what they've done is a good start into like it, creating a lasting culture. And, and I mean, it touches on the, 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 the creativity aspect, which is, here's where I want to get to maybe, I mean, like part of the problem is visualizing what is it we want to get to, but the other part is how do we get from there to here and how do we convey the features of the things that we like in a way that is compelling and contagious to other people? How do we get other people to, to feel the positive things that we're feeling when we're, out in the sun and lifting rocks and doing art and reading the classics and making music and all this other stuff. Like how, how do you convey that in a way that's compelling? Because the problem with a lot of the art that we don't like the art that triggers outrage or sadness is that it is also contagious, right? It, it's very sticky. It's very, uh, and that's why they do it, right? It's a quick way to get a lot of attention and a lot of publicity. Um, I mean, this is why the news is the way that it is, you know, it, it outcompetes the stuff that is bland and kind of boring as far as news is concerned. So like the creativity comes into art in the, like, how do we resolve, how do we connect these things using the tools that we have in maybe a way that hasn't been, and it's, it's like you said, it's like, make it new because we're doing things that people have always done but the application is never exactly the same. We're all, we're never in the same river that Heraclitus was talking about or in a, a new uh, river, a new situation. I feel like I could give, I just need to be an art director. I could give artists jobs for days. <laughs> okay. Like, uh, like I don't have the patience to do any of this, uh, but uh, <laughs> what you uh, basically from what you just said right there, um, and the thing is, there has to be a gal, and this is something that an artist who, uh, Fenda Villa, uh, who I, I, I actually want to have on, I want to hit him up for an interview here pretty soon. Nice. Um, but uh, he, he talks about this a lot. Obviously, you need like a gallery system and all the things that support an art, you know, and people with money that want art in their homes and all this stuff. You need to, to make art, art work, you know, to make the, to make this stuff sticky and last. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, it, when I was in LA, um, it seemed like everybody who was making art was trying to get collected by a celebrity. Like you'd go right. into like an outsider art exhibit, which that was the stuff that I liked at the time. I so saw I go to this, this, uh, uh, Jesus de Luz, I think was one of the galleries. It was all these kind of outsider art, little gallery spaces. And they'd be the people making weird art, but they'd be like collected by uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. And, uh, you know, and so you get some rock star or some celebrity to, to uh, pick up your art. And that's how your art becomes sticky. Like you get it into the hands of somebody who has money and then it becomes like everybody else wants it because they have it. And Association, yeah. that is kind of what you do. So you kind of need to set up a system like that to make that happen. But yeah. just based on your idea of what you said, I mean, this is not like the most like viral stuff, but as far as quality art that could be beautiful that uh, like people would actually buy and put in their homes or that isn't offensive or like trying to be uh trying to be offensive or anything man you could do a whole career of oil paintings in two different styles i mean two different so two different artists uh of men lifting rocks that is I mean, I mean, like, 
that that that's saleable because like that's not like offensive. That doesn't like bother it's anybody. But, like it's yeah. it's inspiring, and you could have it. I'm I'm picturing like kind of like waves come off it because you're out in the sun. So like there's yeah. like a little bit of movement that happens off of that, and then then uh you could do it in like a there's this one painter that I I know who does he does boxers and stuff. So it had she's it's a movement a lot already. Uh, really good oil painter. Uh, I don't know his name right now, but he's it, one of the people I follow on Instagram. And I could see him doing that. And I could also see um, you moving that into like an Italian futurism kind of like vibe where it was like abstracted a little bit of like men lifting rocks and but it was all like geometrical all around it. Like, uh, like I had just envisioned all this art that comes out of that. <laughs> now I'm like, I need to give it to you. You get some weird else. shaped solar flares coming down diagonally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's like, I, I see it. Like, yeah, it, it could be done. It, 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 and there's and that that's that's so, a good direction uh <laughs> you yeah. know like uh, th that's why these things are kind of good um, this was this was kind of purpose done but uh, in a very different vibe this is kind of darker vibe but like i commissioned this yeah for um the cover of the hero and the man and that was like as an artist who specialized in ink dot work suarin jasinski is his name and he does all kinds of stuff in the quasi horror thing but the, like the the spear within the ore was like specifically for Homer as a, as a symbol. And um, the, the vulture wings are, are like mentioned in like the opening lines of the Iliad, the, the, the birds of prey that feasted on the bodies of men on the field. Like you can, you can use art to make ideas sticky. I mean, I, I think Nietzsche tried to do that in the birth of tragedy where he, very intentionally included a picture of Prometheus on the cover because he was at that point, I think he backed away from this later, uh, but was very interested in the, I, the concept of Prometheus and the idea of Prometheus um, and using, using visuals to make, uh, or you could do this with music too, to make ideas uh, sticky and interesting is like, if you're trying to spread good ideas um, it's just using tools and tricks to or not tr tr trick makes it sound too like cunning and sneaky because you're doing it in the open using techniques to try to spread good things basically. Yeah. 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 That, well, and, and there's the, the struggle that I would say the right or whatever. I don't like, yeah, I hate saying that, but um, yeah. is, what does that mean? The, but the not left at this point. The not left. <laughs> the not left. Uh, 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 people who don't work for the WEF or the CIA. I don't think uh, either of us are, are like right wing in like a in like a meaningful, uh, grand historical sense. Only to people who are very left wing. Yes. Uh, <laughs> right. But yeah, you know, the uh, the problem that that group of people uh, has is that uh, they haven't. And, and I have, have it a little bit myself, too, uh, is that the art tends to be didactic. Um, yes. Like, it, it's very about the political feeling or about the aggravation with the political situation or it's about this is how you should be or whatever. Uh, whereas, you know, if you could get... There's a level where you can have that there but it's a background of a piece of like accessible art yeah i mean there's there's narratives that go into like yellowstone but but it's really just really fun art to like watch you yeah. know like that's it, it, there's there you can pick out the narratives that they're slipping in but but it's just really good art and the thing is is that you have to have people who can create really good art and then slip in the narrative rather than just have it be all narrative because right. then it becomes boring. And that's, that's yeah. kind of the way feminist art was in like the 1970s there. I, it's always cool when I can pull a name out of my ass, but like uh, Barbara Kruger is really famous uh, for uh, you've, you've seen her work basically. Like she's very, very famous for making big, like propaganda style signs about uh, on things uh, being like red and black and like uh th th there's this very specific style then that was copied by very many people but um uh, you know it was basically this probably like making propaganda but it was about feminism but that's it's all message 
You know, it's like, oh, okay, you've made, you've said words really big. That's basically yeah. what you did. And, and uh, that's not really that compelling uh, to well, anyone else. And I guess to your point, people get tired of being browbeaten and like ext ext extorted to, or what, what's exhortated at yeah. uh, about like what you should do and care about this. And my, my favorite example to bring up because it's so embarrassing to everybody who remembers taking part of this back in was it 2008, 2009 was a uh, Coney 2012. Um, that was an extraordinary propaganda program, completely fraudulent, complete, uh, complete manipulation, but it, it took in a lot of people, my entire high school, basically, um, which is, is hilarious, uh, in retrospect. And it's, um, so what they, was it? I, I mean, I, I, it's in my peripheral vision of like the world, but I, I, I don't know exactly what it is. Uh, it, there was this movement that was back in, I, f I don't even remember what election cycle it was. It was the last cycle I couldn't vote in. So I think it was um, like Wait, Obama. Obama probably. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, these guys were trying to say, oh, we're thinking about politicians. We need to make Coney famous. And Coney was this um, Christian liberation army leader in Uganda, I guess, or, or somewhere, some part of, Africa, Uganda, you Jason, just like one of those like worst people in the world candidates, you know, right. like recruiting child soldiers and all this. And that's probably largely true. Um, but the, the aid workers that were, had put this campaign together to try to make it famous, basically used all these propaganda techniques that they're using flash mobs, using bright signs, using like early age of the internet social media pushing um, to try to make Coney famous and, and get people to care more about the horrible things that are happening in Africa and sending money to that with the implicit idea that if you donated money to that, or if you raise sufficient awareness, that would stop the problem. My understanding is that they basically just pocketed the money and disappeared um, <laughs> I, I don't know all the details of how it went down. I didn't really pay attention to it because, um, it just kind of disappeared and, and everyone lost interest in, just like they lost interest in apartheid after they ended. Um, but, uh, like it's, it's, it was an interesting example of the use of these like techniques, um, like in, in some ways, like early meme use. Um, but with like physical posters instead of JPEGs. And um, yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure where I was going with that, but but it, just the story of the, the feminist artist kind of reminded me of that. And past a certain level of that kind of exhortation is like, show me something that's like done for its own sake. And, and that is just has internal integrity and I think that's what draws people consistently back to things like Lord of the Rings. Right. Or... No, I, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, just, just to riff on your thing right, right now, because it made me think of something. Uh, <laughs> when I was in uh, when I was in Germany speaking, uh, I, I learned a lot more about the like European like identitarian movement and like the, what they were doing. And uh, it was so much better than anything anyone was doing in America. Um, but they were, they were basically borrowing from green pieces uh, and, and, and intentionally they like, they were doing what Greenpeace does. Uh, and, and uh, you know, they go up to a like world famous national monument and drop a banner. That's like 30 feet long, like uh, of like what they want to say about immigration or whatever they had a problem with, or, you know, I mean, I, I feel uh, absolved about knowing anything about their thing because it's in other languages. Uh, I, like, I don't know what their problems are. <laughs> like, I'm, like it's, I'm just hands off when it comes to Europe. I'm like, I don't know uh, what you guys are doing, uh, but- uh, well, We can admire the technique. Yeah, I'm just admiring the technique. I'm admiring your work. Uh, so uh, there were a lot of guys who, you know, took, they took a lot of pride in making it artistic. Whereas like the Americans were just doing, but, you know, being loud and irritating, but or making memes or whatever. But uh, there were there were people like showing up at operas, dropping banners or whatever. I mean, doing cool stuff. I mean, that was really making an impact, and it was getting it was getting news, and it, and it looked cool. 
it wasn't like here we're being jerks. Uh, it was like here, here's something beautiful that they actually yeah. put a thought into. So it was it was a cool usage of that. But I, uh, I always I, I like to to joke with my wife when we go on walks around the neighborhood um, during election season uh, about how like if you have a gross yard, like if your yard and your lawn are not like taken care of, you should probably not put political like advocacy signs up because it very likely has the opposite effect that you want it to have, <laughs> you know? And, yeah. and the idea of making beautiful signs and interesting signs, as opposed to just ugly, likely misspelled uh, butcher paper things that you hang over an overpass is yeah. like, it, it has a different effect because if you make your advocacy something ugly, it kind of makes your position look ugly. Well, yeah, people don't. Uh, it, it's it's come a long way, but men in America who are conservative or whatever uh, didn't think aesthetics mattered until very recently. I mean, they're like their websites were trash. They're like, uh, I mean, it was really only like probably twenty, you know, fourteen and up that it started to they started to improve it. Like they, you know why that is? Book and it would be like impact font, like on the cover. You, <laughs> you know, know why that is? Real yeah. real, real men don't care what they look like, Jack. Right. <laughs> and also everybody thinks they're amateurs because they're like, shit, it looks like trash. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, but um, it's definitely, it's definitely worth, you know, putting aesthetics do matter. And it's, I see people are realizing that a little bit more now, but it's just really slow on the uptake mm -hmm. as, as to how much it matters and how much the packaging matters. And it's not, uh, it's not cynical to do it. It's just like if you want to. Okay, you want a more beautiful world where you have to. You know, this is this is the thing you have access to. Well, and what's funny is, so working in the trades, no one thinks it's cynical to take the time to make your work look nice in the yeah. trades. No one thinks that's cynical. Right. Um, and 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 I I do feel like joking aside, uh, 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 you know, invoking Tanner Guzzi here a little bit. Um, no one, no one, fewer people, I think, think it's cynical to take the time to dress nicely and wear like clothes that fit and aren't like ripped and like all that kind of stuff. But, um, like there is this, this sense that, uh, if you use the tools of the enemy, you become the enemy, uh, when it comes to art stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't, I don't think people would think that way if they, do my least favorite thing to do, which is take the time to look over and do a basic spell check and like edit the things you write before you send them. Um, but like if you use techniques of, of like rhetoric or persuasion that that's somehow sneaky in a way that like making your construction installations look nice or your clothing look nice is not and there are a lot more when you think about it, there's in many ways they're a lot more similar than they are different and i guess to bring some equality into the equation there is a strange group of guys that are critical of women wearing makeup they think that that's a a, a tool of deception um to, to to wear lipstick and it's like hacking your brain and stuff um but if you can recognize the power and like you can complain about it but women are still going to do that why why not employ tools to just improve the quality of yourself or your message well that that's a long-standing argument about women uh artifices for women Right, like that, that that's it, it, women have artifice and men like uh, have results. Well, and it's, uh, it's you know, like that, yeah, and so that's we that's might have we yeah. might have talked about this before, but it's it's even an argument among men. Uh, going back to you know Plato's Apology and Socrates speaking about his accusers speaking with artifice, right, using technique, whereas he is going to speak directly. He's going to speak a technos without right. artifice, without technique, um, and that's elevated on like a moral level 
But it, it seems to, and we've probably talked about this before because these things keep coming back up, but like that's martyr language. And I mean, he literally lost that trial. Um, yeah. <laughs> but like, uh, like it's a, and maybe that would have to be another, another podcast stream entirely talking about the use of technique and strategy in the pursuit of accomplishments. And do you corrupt the message if you try to, you know, use the art of rhetoric in order to spread it? But um, as far as creativity is concerned and attempt to solve problems in, in spreading culture or for whatever else, um, like the, the problem, like these are maybe not the only techniques, but these are some techniques that are used uh, to, to accomplish the thing that you're trying to do. You're combining them with a different message perhaps, and you need congruence, but no one would say in a war, like if the other side is shooting at you, you can't shoot back or you become just like them. It's like, no, no, no we're, we're on different sides. And this is a neutral tool. If, if someone you hate chooses to water their plants, you're like, oh, I can't water my plants because they, like, like the, the neutrality of a technique, whether it comes to persuasion or, or art or something, I think is, is maybe one of the big factors behind why, as you talk about, men seem to reject art. Maybe. I mean, when I wrote the essay about it, and I don't think this is available anywhere online right now, except for maybe, I think it's, I think it's somewhere on my Twitter. Uh, but because uh, I, I think I republished it there, but uh, there's a concept called sex poison. I, th I believe it's called sex poison uh, that uh, uh, an anthropologist uh, came up with uh, many years ago. And I, I came across it once and then I f it took me forever to find it again because almost no one has talked about it since. But uh, uh, she, wrote, she wrote a book about it, about like how men, um, if something, if women enter a space, then men consider it polluted and then won't go there. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the classic example is the menstrual hut. Like that's a the woman's space and men that men are not to be around that, you know? And that, uh, but I, I've applied it, I think more broadly, I think definitely it happened in the arts. It's like if men, I mean, if, if women and effeminate men enter a space, then men, don't want to do that because the women do it like right. like and that unfortunately what's happened because women do everything in the modern world that's left them with men caves was well, that kind of the isn't that kind of the same thing as like the enemy i mean women aren't the enemy but like in a in a similar concept of we shouldn't do it because that's what they do it's a similar thing i mean it's just it, it is very natural to the sexes uh, to, to do it in that way. It, it, so the idea of it becoming, there's two different things, you know, like at work here, like the effeminacy thing that gets applied to the arts just generally. Um, and that is very much because I think, you know, there was a time when women weren't even allowed to act on stage or like uh, they didn't, they didn't publish poetry. Men did all the art. And then, but as women entered that space, it was more women and effeminate men, and uh, men don't like to go where women and effeminate men go because they don't want to be contact queered by them. <laughs> like they don't want to be contact effeminate by hanging around with that group because men men want to like be separate from that. And it's very natural to their state because our whole our, the whole way we come into being is by separating ourselves by from the mother and from women and becoming something different. And so, like, the, to create that sexual boundary there is 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 important to men and women. So it's it's very natural to have that, but we have it in modern society where it becomes tiresome. Like, uh, like I don't deal a lot with women, so like I don't have uh, a whole list of things that women do that I don't want to be caught doing because women do them. But a lot of guys do. Key example is uh, taking pictures of your food. 
that became the biggest thing that men were just furious about because they sat at dinner with their girlfriends and their girlfriends sat there and did that. And they're like, I would never be caught dead doing that because, because it's what women do, you know, you know, whereas it's a neutral thing. Yeah. It's a neutral thing. Like it, Oh, you can take a good picture of food. Uh, but uh, because their girlfriends did it, they hated it. And, and so like, and that was a thing that men don't do. And, and so like, there's all kinds of things that, that, that be, that, just happen in society that men don't want to do them because they see women do them all the time. Unfortunately, that 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 corrals off a lot of things that that men men used to do, like you know, drinking like from Stanley cups. Well, yeah, I mean, right? Because Stanley <laughs> I used a, to be about camping. <laughs> that's a man's brand that he said for decades, for decades, for the whole its whole history. It's been a manly brand. It's a Stanley. It has a man's name, and now like. Yeah, I mean, those certain ones are like that certain cup became like all the chicks had to have it. And now, like, dudes don't want it. You know, like, uh, it, 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 that's very it, totally a good example. Uh, you know, for if uh, women like a certain kind of music or a certain kind of thing, like, it becomes viral among, among women. Men don't want to do it because it's what women like. And so it's that's that's the, the sex poison part of it. Because I, I feel like that, you know, there's very much a thing. Like, if you, if you went to art school, uh, that that was like a thing that men don't do, you know, like a, like or that it's like it, it's definitely a raised eyebrow in a lot of parts of the country, and and uh, so there's that part of it, but there's also this other feature about deceptiveness that you were talking about, and uh, men we used to talk about this when we talk about magic, uh, Clinton and I, uh, because there's certain kinds of magic and things like that that men weren't supposed to do in very masculine cultures because they were about deception and you can even characterize it in like a conan the barbarian is way. that like say there yeah yeah which which clinton actually would say now is actually the real name for all the religion that they actually practice because he told me that today in a dm but because that's if you look at that's what his thing is called because he was saying also true isn't really a name of anything <laughs> uh <laughs> but uh that sidebar but uh but no i mean it, at that, but that understanding, I know what discussion you're talking about is basically like men weren't supposed to do things, certain kinds of like fortune telling uh, is considered effeminate because like you should just go do things. Why would you worry about what the fort the fort tell fortune telling is? Uh, it, it seems effeminate to them. And yeah. uh, and uh, like if you put it in a code and the barbarian sense, like well, there's the dude who just does action. And is very forthright and up, upright. He just performs actions, and then there is sorcerers. Right. Sorcerers deal in like words and creepiness and like they, slithering in the background and like you know like it, it's it's like the kind of you know an upright. Uh, put it in Game of Thrones context. You have like the the uh, Stark family, very upright, like honest. We're honest. Yeah. We do what we say. We're da, 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 da. And then everybody else in the kingdom is like mechanism behind it like yeah all kinds of machiavellian like things so well, it's, it's like it, that's always kind of been a, a conflict with men which is you know this straightforward talking and it, i know you, you might even take it right to achilles and, and odysseus but it, it, it's this straight talking kind of like side. i was trying to avoid it <laughs> i know i know i felt it coming <laughs> but uh, but uh it actually the Iliad... go back you know there it's it's an over it's a thing that happens over and over again it's like yeah. sorcerers and strategy guys and like guys who like twist words around and are a little sneaky yeah. and are distrustful of them. Why? Because they've been fucked over by them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And you will continue to be, but, but like, th that's like saying you, you don't want to like, this goes back to the whole, like, like just because an enemy shoots at you, that doesn't mean the gun is the problem. Right. You know, it's it's the, the the guy on the other side, right? Or rather the guy who's telling him to go and shoot at you. Like the, the there is a there's a problem. We were talking like before the podcast a little bit about politics and stuff, mm -hmm. but I, I follow Scott Adams, who's an artist and a creative type, um, and also a hypnotist. So he's a he's a bit of a sneaky sorcerer type. Um, and he's been saying for months now, probably years actually. That the Democratic Party, to whatever, to whatever degree it isn't already this, is becoming the party of women. 
Yes. And there's there's all these kinds of reports coming out how men are. I would have told you that ten years ago. But all yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but but like he's he, he's like just trying to uh, either he's just come around to this posi position recently, or he thinks there is persuasive power in bringing up that point now when it might not have been a few years ago. I think with someone like him, the latter is probably more likely. But like you, if you want to fight sorcerers, um, which is something we've talked about before <laughs> a few times, like it helps to know a little bit about it. Yeah. Good luck fighting that and like controlling your armies of crazy women um, that are being taken from you by other people who are willing to use these things without yeah. understanding these techniques, you know. Good luck winning battles that where other people are shooting at you without picking up a gun in response. Right. Um, and so, like the employment of our, and I think I think there's something almost. It, it's not even a gendered point at this point, but there's something. Uh, I'll, I'll go with uh, immature about caring so much about other people's opinions that you will decide not to do something because you're concerned about like what other people might think of you in a hypothetical abstract kind of way. I mean, the person that came to immediately to my mind when you were thinking about, um, or you're talking about, Oh, guys don't go to art school. Guys don't do this is um, your friend, AJ Cortez. Yeah. Who rose up to be probably one of the most successful online physical trainers in the world yeah. from a background in ballet right and dance and like that's a woman's thing right yeah but yeah that, like, that is taboo that is sexually taboo for men yeah. yeah and that is that is that is not an effeminate guy by no, any stretch of the imagination all. um but he, he's like okay here's a thing how can i employ it in a way that is advantageous to me and and to other people because he's trying to help other people improve and that like no matter what you do whether it's art or ballet or theater or whatever there's like there's a feminine way of approaching that and expressing it but there's also a masculine way of approaching and expressing it and i think part of the challenge in becoming a man is just getting over those impeding associations that prevent you from wanting to do things some of which are incidental some of which feel kind of imposed oh absolutely and they are imposed and they are like straight up psyops uh in terms of uh, you can the thing is that most men are insecure most men are really insecure and they're insecure because they don't have a gang. Uh, oh, Jack, <laughs> like, Jack, Jack, don't... That's something feminists say. We can't say that too. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? But no, but there, there are most men are insecure, and that's something that feminists got right. They just got it right for the wrong reasons. There, um, most men are insecure why because they don't have they they aren't they aren't really they don't really have a peer group. They don't have any validation that they're men from other men, and so they they have all these superficial validations, which are uh things that you can buy and things that you all these consumer things that make them men like you know whether it's having a beard or uh you know like having a big truck or writing these things and they aren't they aren't that hey i'm accepted in this group of other men and that make um, I'm a man because all these other men also validate that i'm a man uh it, it is they're kind of alone and trying to like desperately validate their masculinity through things it makes them very easily manipulated to uh, by advertisers and political candidates and so forth, uh, and so that's yeah. I mean that that's that's very. If they had a more solid foundation of themselves and had been proven themselves as men, they wouldn't be as easily manipulated. But most men are very easily manipulated in this way, and that's what it is. A side. I mean, like I've probably said it before, but I mean they they literally used me that me in that way. I'm a wedge figure. Like uh, they, they like uh, there's that uh, Catholic parasite dude who made a video uh, saying the way of men is gay. Why? Because he wants everybody to, to be Catholic and read his shit. Yeah, uh, because, and because, it's not because, because anything that's already real. Can, it's just can, like, don't do it because the gays do it. Like they, there's. Can I, gay. can I, 
you know. Can I throw something out real quick? My sure. uh, my grandfather went to seminary. Yeah, he ended up dropping out uh, yeah. because he discovered that like like ninety five to a hundred percent of the other guys in seminary are not heterosexual. I know. So, so the yeah, I <laughs> hearing that from a Catholic is is kind of kind of amusing. Yeah, yeah. My my oldest fan that I have, I mean, might be might be still be alive. Uh, but my oldest fan was actually a Catholic priest who was gay and quit the, quit the priesthood because he was like, "Well, this is you know, he, he's a really honorable guy, really. Uh, he was a good dude." But uh, but no, and, he, and and they did that with the uh, the the uh, alt right with me. Uh, there was a big push. All of a sudden, everything, every article that was out, I was like, gay, 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 gay. And, uh, you know, like, I never talked about it. Uh, it was just one of those things. It's like, hey, if you do what this guy says, you know what that says about you? And for a whole bunch of insecure dudes, that's that's a manipulation. And they knew that. And it was like a coordinated effort. I, I, I will uh, believe that till my death. Like, that, that, that was like, it all happened at once. And uh, I've seen it happen uh, a little bit again recently, so I hope we're not going down that road again. Uh, I just got like tagged in a whole bunch of things with Manosphere stuff. They're, they they were using that. They were using me as a wedge in the Manosphere then uh, for a little bit, uh, especially those traditional Catholic guys were doing it. But then there were a couple other people who, who I think you know. I, I don't. Know, I got tagged by some leftist today in some thing with other man like Fresh and Fit and all these people that like. It was about this video. It was this video of this, these, this, it, it was like a cell phone. It was like this really fat dude and this really ridiculous guy making a video about how Manosphere guys are really afraid of women. And it was like, no one wants to be these guys. They were pathetic. <laughs> um, but and like, and, and it was, so it was a big, it was, it was like not convincing. Like, be like us. <laughs> we're secure. No, you're not. Uh, but, uh, so it was ridiculous, but he sent this. Somebody sent it to me like out of the blue, and, and I'm tagged in it like as like part of the thing of like I'm like, I, when was the last time I talked about women in the essay? Like never. Uh, I don't really talk about women on on a regular basis, uh, but but we're so afraid of women was the the song. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, so I think people people use that. They use that as a as a wedge. Like if you can make man insecure and be like you do that you're like gay or like a girl or whatever then then they won't do it yeah. and then so it's it's a um it's it's an ongoing thing that men have to be aware of that air be manipulated in that way yeah and and, and I, I think you're right it's like it comes down to having your 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 group of guys whose opinions you do care about because there's stability there you know like yeah. i have you know i have an obligation to what my family thinks, what my what my in-laws think about me and and what my coworkers think about me. Like that's that's a nice one because it's cut and dry. There's clear standards of you know speed, quality worksmanship, things like that. Um, what you think of like the stuff I write, uh that there, so there's there's a, a fairly small ish, and then there's some people online who have become friends with over time who's like opinion really matters to me. I was just speaking to a family member um, yes, uh, yesterday, actually, who listened to one of our podcasts okay. and or, or watched it, and he had some criticisms. He says, he, he, he told me, he's like, if you look at Jack and his chair and his lighting and his screen and his background, he's got it all set up in the cinematic way. And you've got this kind of basement vibe going. Your lighting is not as clear stuff. I think you're doing yourself a disservice. I'm like, if you were closer, I would have fixed that already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you well, know, it's like, but it's like, but it's like, if that was a random person on the internet, I'd be like, oh, someone's just trying to demoralize me. But because huh. of who it was, I'm like, that's a that's a very like, okay, I I can swing by the hardware store, pick up some paint, and like move some things, and maybe pick up a ring lighter, you know, whatever. Um. I, I might know a guy who can install some lights. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I, I can, I can go to work on that. And that, and that's like valuable criticism. Yeah. But if, if so, just some rando who doesn't like what I'm saying about whatever subject says, look at this guy's trash setup or whatever. Right. It's like uh, part of being a man and being able to, I, I shouldn't say being a man, part of being able to be successful and in control of your own emotions Mm -hmm. and your own trajectory 
being like AJ Cortez is being able to compartmentalize those kinds of things as being like just bubbles that float by. It's just like, Oh, that's a, a useless comment carrying on, you know? Um, Cause it feels like that's a lot of what these association psyops are and they, they become impediments to creativity. They become impediments to being able to, to, do that connection making between unlike things in, in, in pursuit of some uh, worthwhile goal. And I, it's, I, once I thought of creativity that way, I almost like, what else is there to say about it? It's just, it's just all like, how do you get the impediments out of the way and uh, find the right raw material, find the right clay to do the thing that you want to do. Well, I mean, there's lots of there's lots more to say about, it, but uh, it, it's, well, yeah, uh, fair. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, it, it, there's uh, in terms of I was thinking the other day I wrote a little thing on prompts and uh, how how valuable they are. I mean, there if you if you go to creative writing things, they're like you can you can get lists of creative writing prompts to like yes. you know like stretch your muscles on that. And the same thing is true with like art stuff and whatever. It's like uh, you know do this, do this because. Gets gets the brain working. Gets it. It creates creates creativity. You know, like some, gets, some of those are really fun. Yeah. Just just as as examples too. I, I saw a creative writing prompt two days ago. Uh -huh. Actually, it was a uh, it was uh, the creative writing prompt for short stories. Uh, vampires exist and are in the world. They can only enter your house if you're invited in. But they invented a solution to that. Back in the 1970s, they invented welcome mats and spread them out. And now they can enter everyone's house at will. <laughs> like, and go. <laughs> Write your story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's, there's lots of fun stuff what? like that. That that that, that, that then create a, You could create an HBO show off of that. You know, like there's 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 a uh, um, there's all kinds of things like that that they can, they can spawn creativity. And that, that's yeah, as far as you know, bringing it back to that point. I mean, it's a, that's a, an interesting direction, but. Uh, oh, I was going to say, and uh, maybe what's time? How, where are we? Oh, we're about about, about time. Um, I was going to say, circling back to the idea of using the enemy's techniques. Mm -hmm. I think the part to be wary of, is, and that I think a lot of people see, especially with social media, is you can use the techniques, but sometimes it becomes about the techniques. And that's when yeah. it becomes the problem. Uh, when success with the techniques means more than the actual thing that you were trying to do in the first place, that then you start to change your message according to the techniques. There's like a, a Marshall McLuhan dynamic where the, the medium becomes the message. And um, like... I don't, I don't know if Marshall McLuhan's, you know, uh, saying is, is the, the complete truth, but there's definitely some truth to it. And so there's like a, there's a balance between, um, you know, who you want to become and what you have to do. But uh, some of this is sort of beyond our control as well. Like if you think about it in evolutionary terms in the animal kingdom, like where, uh, you know, a, a peregrine falcon is, as someone put it, basically a a a, a parrot that min-maxed into speed. Um, it's not even like a raptor in the in the like sense of like eagles and hawks. It's right. it's more like a, a parrot. But like it it didn't the the peregrine falcon didn't choose to become the way it was. It just did things that worked and, um, you know, it became a new thing based on adopting the strategy that worked and caused it to survive and flourish. I think, I think a big criticism of a lot of the techniques that people are hesitant to adapt is that some of these techniques are self-defeating in the long run. Like, I think we've seen this a lot in, in, um, we'll say science, the medical world, um, you can be really, really persuasive for a very small amount of time 
if you give up, if you trade off integrity with a sense of urgency. Right. You know? But but then you lose all of your persuasiveness for the next 20 years. Yeah. So like uh th like that's that's not a very sustainable model for you know spreading your cultural message, your identity that you want to push. Um, so maybe there's a balance. Um, but like the problem there is not with the technique per, um, in, in terms of what it turns you into. The problem there is that it will destroy you too. It's, it's just refusing to play some like short-term musical ga chairs game for quick, quick, uh, quick re rewards and results before you can put the buck on your second in line and then ditch for the Bahamas or whatever. Right. And, and that's, I mean, you see this, I think everybody, and it's creepy to the extent that young people are aware of it now, uh, but you can see what works online and what you, what gets the most attention and you could make choices to do those things. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have no center and if you have no integrity and you have no, like, this is, this is what I'm about. And this is not what I'm about. And you're just trying to get attention because a lot of people just start that way. I mean, if you would have, if I would have had social media in my twenties, God knows that would have been terrible. Uh, cause at the time I just wanted attention. Yeah. I uh, you know, it wasn't really about anything, you know, like what, what, you know, I mean, I went to art school, like what, what's going to get attention? What's going to be like shocking and interesting. Wow. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm an edge Lord by nature. And, and so like Logan Paul. Yeah. yeah and, and so you have those things. And if you're just doing that to get attention, then you're going to be, you're, you'll just go where the wind blows. Yeah. You do anything. And you have these basically dancing whores and, you know, like often literally dancing that, especially, I don't know if it's as much of a trend now, but it's like, you know, if you want to be a big deal on TikTok, you're going to start dancing. And you actually had like maybe people who shouldn't be dancing, dancing, you know, like, uh, and, or like uh, I remember somebody criticized him, and I, I haven't seen him done this since. But like, you know, these viral like things that people do uh, to get more attention, uh, people who would end up doing them who shouldn't be doing them. Like uh, I saw somebody criticize Tim Kennedy one time because uh, he made or had someone make a reel of him where he's speaking high voice like this because it was like something. And it was so off brand for him. Like it was like, why are you? That's no, not leave that. Leave that, doing. Matt, leave that for Matt Best, man. Leave that. For yeah, Matt. yeah. But I mean, I, I haven't seen him do a lot of stuff like that since. Maybe they yeah. realize he was like, yeah, that's not me. I won't do that. But I mean, there is an allure to that. Like, here's the techniques. Here's what works. Here's what get my attention. But then it becomes not what you are anymore. And yeah. uh, I mean, I've tried to do that to a certain extent. With, uh, I mean, I, to my great detriment. If I wanted to ride the thing, like ride it, ride it hard, all I need to do is start taking pot shots at people, and then I have to be prepared for them to take pot shots at me, uh, and that's something I'm not really super interested. In. I get enough of that anyway, but um, it, you know, like you, you live by that sword, you die by the sword. But some people like the game, and they're yeah. like, "Come at me, bro," and they'll do it. And so that's what a lot of like online culture is—is is just like shit talking other dudes. And that was never something that I felt like was uh, dignified and uh, or sincere. It, it comes off as insincere. A lot of these guys start beefs with each other just like they're both kinds of in on it. Like they like almost like professional wrestling. Yeah. Uh, that that happens a lot online. And, and uh, that's that's not really if we, we think of like what kind of culture do we want? That is yeah. not it. But 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 like while we find that distasteful. WWE itself is kind of fun, though. Oh well, yeah. I mean, well, I so, did that one like thing where I went and trained with professional wrestlers, right? Right. I mean, it's in on the. I mean, they're in on the joke, and and it's. I think that's kind of well, it's framed only, that way. It's not even. It's not even a joke anymore. It seems like at that point, it's it's actual theater. It is yeah. a performance, and I think the thing that makes internet beefs and like. The, the more absurd kinds of internet blood sports debates feel distasteful is that there's this, there's this um, sincerely presented pretense of seriousness. 
Right. Like, like the, the people watching think it's real. And so like, the, uh, and, and we have the sort of this problem in our news media situation where a couple people have been sued for libel or sued for, you know, whatever kind of usually libel and their legal defense is, I'm not actually a news anchor. I'm an entertainer. Right. I'm a character. And this has happened on, on both sides of the aisle. And yeah. so it's a, like the, all the people watching their show didn't think you were an entertainer. All the people watching your show thought they were becoming informed about the world. Right. So like that, there was some line that was crossed where WWE, like people who attended no longer thought they were watching UFC. Right. And believed that they were watching drama and they're here for it. And it's yeah. great. But like, if you came to WWE expecting UFC and you were sold UFC, yeah, there's something there's something shady about that. Exactly. Um, which is, uh, yeah, like uh, it, it makes the whole question of of art and and maybe you can still use these techniques, but it brings a kind of ethical imperative, not even to other people, but to yourself, like an ethical imperative to yourself to be forthright in what you're doing. Right. And if if the effectiveness of what you're doing is contingent upon deception and you're not actually in a hot war with someone. Um, what are you doing? <laughs> right. And I think that's, again, it comes to, down to the question of, like I said, uh, we're talking about solar ideals and what, what kind of culture we want. I mean, it's like we, we are, you know, it is our job to, to be examples of that. You know, I, you're like, well, what do you, what do you, what, if you're going to criticize the world and say it's crappy, um, well, what are you doing that's better? And that's why that's why I've always like uh, I was joking the other day that I need to pull this video down just because uh, I can never use a word with picture uh, picture with words again. But uh, you know, I made this video about like memes and how they suck, and uh, I was really at the time just criticizing Wojak memes and 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 memes like that, like right wing memes when they were basically like little scribbly crap drawings saying that culture was crappy and i'm like do you understand how ridiculous you are the problem <laughs> like, like your, your profile is a pepe frog drawing saying how culture is crappy you are the problem you you are the degenerate <laughs> like and like uh and that was the point i was really trying to get across i don't think i did it as well as i should have but the same thing it's like well if i was out there being trashy every day and then um, saying that we should be the highest versions of ourselves. Uh, like those things don't go together. Uh, you know, so it's like, yeah, I, you know, you can have fun and be a human, but at the same time, like, well, you have to try and not just be a glaring hypocrite about everything that you do, you know, which is not always the best path, you know, like, uh, if you want to get your, want to get your message out to the most people, but like, you know, at some point, do you even have a message? You know, like your message gets lost and all that. So I think that's the struggle that I think a lot of creative people have as well. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And it's a it's a struggle because if you're going to try to do art, it's not just a here's a message and here's a mechanism. Here's a medium. You have to, in some sense, match the medium to the message. Um, I remember listening to Martin Amos, a fairly famous English writer, mm -hmm. say uh, good etiquette as a writer um, has nothing to do with manners. It has nothing to do with not offending the, the reader. Good etiquette as a writer has to do with matching the, the tone and the style of the writing to the content and ha the, having there be co cohesiveness and integrity um, within the, the thing itself. And so choosing the correct medium is not just about uh you know what what works i'm just going to combine a thing that works with the thing i'm trying to do um, like sometimes that works but uh, at some point like integrity in the artistic sense and integrity in the mortal in the moral sense kind of merge uh in the sense that you your life as an artistic expression um, 
is like, or if you view your life as an artistic expression, then the, the, your own integrity in your character is actually the same in kind as the integrity that artists talk about in, in giving a coherent message and, and expression of an idea. Yeah. Well, I mean, why, well, it's also helpful to look like what you say you are. Uh, you know, right. like, that's, that, that's yeah, uh, a huge thing uh, on the internet and a huge thing, like just generally speaking, it's like, well, if you're giving, it's good marketing, but it's also good for your own sanity. Oh, totally. Well, I mean, it looks like you look like what you say you are and, yeah. and uh, you know, and it's not just looks, obviously the more you can be, the thing uh, within a certain level of integrity, then, you know, like that's, that's obviously better. Uh, you know, but yeah. So anyway, all right. I think we got uh, enough creativity. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I went off into different areas, but that seems to be the, the, the case anyway. Uh, it's just kind yeah. of jumping off subject uh, that we wanted to get hit on. But I think uh, we had a lot of good areas in that. And uh, we yeah, well, it's, it's, it's hard to give any kind of, of, singular summary of a subject as broad as creativity is just a like here are some things to think about for other people who are trying to to struggle to find some creative expression and who are maybe maybe feel themselves to be I inhibited in some way from that yeah yeah well we want to do i mean a lot of what we do on this show is actually just um like well let's take something and look at it from my solar idealist perspective. Like, what do we, what, what, what are ideology are we building? Uh, take all these subjects and like, well, what's our spin on it? Like, what, where are we at? And over time, we define that into like, well, no, this is clearly where we're at. Uh, like I said, I won't, I won't get into it, obviously, but we had a little, dis there was a little dispute yesterday in the order, and. Uh, <laughs> And it was a lot. It's because the guys were all like, "We're on the same page." What are you talking about? You know, like uh, you know, with somebody. And yeah. uh, it's just one of those things that we need to like, you know, like uh, over time we've kind of arrived at certain conclusions, and that's really what culture is. Uh, you know, like a whole bunch of people are like, eh, "We're about this." You know, like uh, yeah, it, we're not about that. You know, like we, we've kind of figured it out. And that's what culture is. So. Um, you know, that's how we define ourselves. I, I was always hesitant to make a whole bunch of rules about what we are and what we aren't like right up, up front because, you know, you, you kind of have to figure that out. You know, like if you're going to have a group, like what, what do we all agree on? What don't, don't we, you know? Well, so I, I know we, we agreed that we're not for flat earth. Um, yes. But what about, what about flat sun theory? She's fucking crazy. <laughs> Someone just, pointed out the other day, like, well, how do flat Earth people explain uh, the eclipse? Um, like, 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 <laughs> they have explanations for everything. I know they, they totally everything. Do. They totally do. But yes, it, it's, it's uh, yeah, flat Earth is haram uh, because there, there's a uh, uh, because it has to be right. It, the whole metaphor of the sun and solar idealism falls yeah. apart. My, my favorite. Uh, my favorite flat earth argument I heard was um, I, I had brought up with a friend, like, what about the Coriolis effect? You know, how if you shoot a bullet and if you don't calculate the rotation of the earth beyond like a thousand yards, you start to miss by yeah. like, a small amount, but further. And they, they like sat on that for a couple of weeks. And then they found some like posts from another flat earth. There's like, people keep bringing up the Coriolis effect. Did you know artillery shooters don't use the Coriolis effect at all? And they're shooting over like 15, 20 miles. And I'm like, I just read that. And it's like, you realize artillery is not a precision instrument. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? <And> it's like, <laughs> it was, a, it was kind of a, a... But, but, but they, 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 found, they found an answer. Well, yeah, yeah they found really the, the right yeah. answer, but they found an answer. So yeah, yeah like, like I said, I always think that's a psyop just to make questioners look <laughs> stupid. Yeah, <laughs> but they didn't get us, not on that one. Sure, we psyop in some other way. Yeah, uh, but uh, anyway, cool, man. Well, it was, it was great to having a, a, a show. 
uh, having a good conversation. Uh, we can always, we pretty much do this without other people. And I don't even know how many people are watching. I didn't even look at the thing. Uh, but we do, we have about yeah. the same amount of people who watch or at least view uh, each of our podcasts. So well, I guess and, we have a growing audience. And, and but, speaking of a growing audience, Mad Poet also asks, he says, I have felt creatively constipated when attempting to write recently. Any tips, tricks, uh, spells, whatever. Thanks. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, that's why I started originally getting into meditation. It wasn't for like, like centering myself, but I was just like, uh, you know, that helped a little bit, uh, kind of guided meditation stuff, not guided by anybody else, but just like, you know, sit down and, and uh, meditate with, uh, you know, some of the music that like gets you in the headspace or whatever. And you just yeah. kind of your mind go, uh, that's a creative thing. Uh, that's, uh, movement is underrated walking, uh, walking yeah. is fantastic yeah walking i mean a lot of stuff uh, yeah, i get better mm -hmm. ideas once they get out of the house uh if you're yeah. sitting there scared at a blank screen that's a, that's a thing uh just to jar some things loose and then other times like you maybe need to like go and look a whole bunch of inspiration or as i was saying prompts prompts um, yes I, yeah. I i have noticed in myself there was a time where i was writing something on instagram like fairly serious basically every day um, yeah. I've completely fallen off the wagon recently, not completely, but like not nearly what I was doing before. And it's because, uh, I've been laid off and I've been at home, uh, for a decent amount of time. I'm not out on the road commuting two hours a day, listening to Scott Adams or Tim pool or Sargon or Weltgeist talk about Nietzsche or weird statues. Um, and, and like those, those things that are those external prompts, those external mm -hmm. stimuli become, um, you know, uh, intersection points that, that you can in, in a web of connections that you can draw from as analogies or metaphors or references that you can either weave together into your own thing or what you can draw from as I usually do in response to something else. Someone will say, what do you think about this? And I'll be like, well, that reminds me of this other thing. And then that leads to like a mini essay uh, that, that comes out. And um, I imagine that's true for creative writer types as well, where you just like, you know, you read a bunch of fiction and you're like, wow, this is really cool. I like this style, but I wish you didn't do this thing. And then right. you you take that point of differentiation, or you think, well, what if what if someone were to do this, but they were to do it in that setting, and right. the but but it's still a kind of an almost reactive response to a prompt, essentially, and um, that 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 combination of movement with external prompt seems to uh, clear out creative constipation, like uh, like coffee it's fantastic no I, it's 100 percent true i mean like i i would often think about like now like a lot of times i don't know what to say but like you know i wrote the way i remember i was driving a delivery truck uh like uh you know same deal like i was out in the world and we were with the people uh and and it's like i don't want to react just to twitter you know like i don't want to act because yeah. it's all political stuff but, like i want uh like i need different inputs and so well, the tricky thing is to find the inputs that are going to send you in the direction you want to go. Exactly. And to, to draw from one of our commie artists we were making fun of earlier, um, Maynard from Tool uh, started a, a vineyard and, yeah. a, and a wine cellars. And he, he said in an interview with Revolver, his reason for doing this was you see so many bands that get so enmeshed in tour life living on the bus, you know, and all this stuff. And it's just, it's just lawyers and tour logistics and money and hotels. And then eventually at some point their songs just become about that. Yeah. And then they lose connection with the audience. Just like when Bon Jovi wrote De wanted dead or alive. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing came in my head. Yeah. I'm fixing the tour video. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like, it's like, so he in, in wanting to avoid that fate, as an artist, right. he said, I need to get back to some kind of grind or struggle that's connected with the earth and connected with like real life. And so he opened a vineyard and he started and um, 
uh, you can sense a fair bit of that kind of like the inspiration that that experience as a farmer essentially has had not so much on tools music but on some of um some of like Pucifer, one of his other bands um music in, in the lyrics but also just the sound um as well and it's like that that connection um with with movement uh in getting out of the stultifying repetition which is i guess the, the musician equivalent of staring at a blank word document um helps tremendously it's a prompt yeah yeah we definitely need prompts i think we underestimate how much we need them especially like like i said the kind of stuff that you and i both write uh is very much reliant on like uh I mean, some of the best essays that I've ever written, I mean, I don't really write essays very much anymore, but some of the best essays that I've ever written uh, have been like, oh, oh, hell no. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. and like okay, if someone gets you on a tear about something and you're like, oh, no, this is some fucking bullshit. And this is why I need to go talk about it for like a half an hour. Uh, you know, but yeah. that's, and without that prompt, like you're just like, I don't know what I'm worried about. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a tricky thing. And it's true in history too. You know, Homer wrote his works in sort of the in sort of the post-apocalyptic, you know, calm after the storm that was the Bronze Age collapse. Yeah. You know, Augustine wrote City of God like in the months or maybe years following the sack of Rome. You know, uh, like these these low points in history in terms of standard of living are often high points in terms of art and the accomplishments of artists. And um, perhaps it has to do with that, with that, but like these grand events are prompts of a kind and they're prompts that, that they, you know, the artist can't ignore or avoid, but it also gives them the audience a point of connection to the, to the meaning of that. Yes, absolutely. So not only should you write your novel at work, got it. You should write your novel about 9-11. <laughs> I'm sorry. Too soon? Too soon? <laughs> no, not too soon. 23 years? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no. But, but no, it is a uh, – um, one thing that that does bring up is that I think there's a hesitancy for a lot of us to write about our own era because we see it as like uninteresting. Oh, we have such an interesting era. Yeah, I mean, but like it seems fascinating. It seems, I mean, like I, you know, like in my mind, I'd much rather you know be writing uh, about. I mean, I think a lot of men uh, they much rather be writing about some like age of adventure uh, rather than um, uh, like you know we have all this you know like oh social media and like all these things seem very not poetic. Uh, and, and I think that, I mean, I, I, I'd have problems like writing a creative piece about like, you know, modern life, like, uh, like, oh, when I was down at the grocery store buying, uh, to go sushi, but like, you know, people obviously did that, like with their, whatever their actual experience yeah. was, uh, they, they were, uh, incorporating that into what they were doing. So I think that I, I do, I think there's a hesitancy with a lot of people about to, to, to see their age as being less poetic and interesting. And well, this is uh, this is the problem that creativity is, is th that muscle that we need to train is is there to help solve because it's like what do we find noble and what do we see around us that's all you need and, yeah. and then it's i mean it's up to you to find those dots and to draw the connections but if, if you have what is noble and beautiful like universally in existence a and b what is going on around me like in the world that i can visually and emotionally convey to an audience in a beautiful manner right right Does, that's, a, that's, that's a good way to, to, to look at it i hadn't really thought about it as a problem and, until just we had this discussion i'm like Mm -hmm. kind of is because uh, because like think of all the beautiful depictions of war war is shitty like yeah. objectively and and not just now not just getting drone bombed in the middle of nowhere um it was shitty back then too <laughs> there's no point in history where war wasn't shitty the, yeah the but the 
there's something beautiful in looking at that shittiness in the face and stepping forward anyways. And that gives us the charge of the light brigade. Hmm. You know, there's something like, and you can look around at the shittiness around us and, and find that same spirit. And it's not in war. It's not in like winged Hussar charging towards probable death or, you know, anything like that. It's, it, it you know, but you have to, the the work has to be done. You only don't see it because the artistic work hasn't been done yet. That's right. your job. That's your job, right? Is to depict the beauty and the strength in the people that are pushing through the shittiness. And there is so much opportunity there. It's it's almost mind blowing how people can look around and see. Like, oh, the art hasn't been done yet. That tells me why there's beauty here. So we live in an upside down world. We live in clown world because it hasn't been pointed out to me yet. Mm. Now, all we have of the past are the people who have done that work and pointed out the you know beauty and nobility and strength and virtue of the people who survived in those shitty times. The mundane, petty uh like capricious shittiness did not survive because it was normal and not worth commenting on and certainly no one with artistic skill would have wanted to waste their time you know immortalizing that um or you have to imagine. invent or you have to invent a climax i mean you have to invent a climax yeah. where perhaps there was none or get an idea i think a lot of people get ideas from things that happen in the news and then, like, hey, we can quick transpose this thing into this thing that I know. I was trying to think of like uh, something mundane, and uh, I thought a taxi driver. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm like, so this is literally like it's pretty fucking mundane. That's the dude who drives a taxi. But yeah. you make that into you take that and you turn it into an entire you know discussion about you know masculinity and human nature and and uh, uh, the God's lonely man. And you know, like all the yeah. but, but veterans like, and all that. Yeah. Here, here's a prompt that someone could write: a a veteran uh, who gets just wrapped up in the VA and crappy paperwork, and, and and just ends up having it, abandons his apartment, abandons his car, and chooses to live voluntarily homeless on the street. But he doesn't just become a druggie. He, he, he like does it with like, like discipline and he, he has spots and he systematizes it. He employs his training in the military to just escape the, the, the Kafka world of the paperwork bureaucracy and creates like a, like a, a pizza delivery cartel gang that comes to dominate like you could you could go all kinds of directions in it and create oh, oh, a no, I, I was story. the entire time you're saying that the entire time i'm like i'm like winking at the solar bastards i'm like or plans a heist uh <laughs> like <yeah. laughs> yeah. i mean they were halfway to like the to like having a whole heist planned out just as a theoretical exercise <laughs> and uh and that's that's a whole like thing because it's a, like a veteran. Like, what do I do with these skills of like special forces skills of like your area reports and all these things that you're doing? Uh, I mean, uh, I love it actually. You like, use your human intel training to yeah. create an army of hobos. What you do with your army of hobos that you pay in scrap copper that you get from we'll won't mention. Um, you know, <laughs> like you, you can you can create all kinds of things. And what would be especially fun is if you did like you use real characters now like there aren't existing stories of that you might have to be a bit of a journalist you might have to actually go out and look at things and talk to people which is like mind-blowing in a world what? of twitter in yeah. a world of twitter or x or instagram or whatever yeah. but like you can still go do that um the first girl i ever dated got mad at me once because she caught me uh, having conversations with homeless people on the bus. Uh, she's like, you shouldn't be talking to them. I'm like, why not? They're interesting. They're like oftentimes retarded, but like uh, some of them are not. Like I learned things from homeless people. Yeah. Like I, I, one guy said, oh, if you see someone with tin foil inside their bag, 
do you know what that means? I was like, I have no idea what that means. It's like they're using it to get stuff past metal detectors or, or, or like those, those theft sensors. Uh, and apparently he knew that because his daughter had gotten, had, he had caught his daughter stealing stuff and made her go back and turn it in and stuff. But like now he's on the street or something. But uh, I was like, huh, that's like a little, there's in fact like things you pick up from that, like connection with the earth going out for a walk. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But there are, there are great stories to tell if you, but you, you might have to go out and find them. Yeah, well, that's that's why people like cities, I think, too. Like uh, mm -hmm. people that tend to gravitate towards cities because there's just a lot more of that. There's just a lot more of like everything, you know, like every every one you could find is right there, <laughs> rather than like like I live in the suburbs, like you know, there's yeah. not, not as much going on. But uh, I mean, Spirit you know, still says, stuff. "Don't let Reginald know what the bastards are doing." And Mad Poet says, "Render the mundane transcendent, the hideous captivating." Well, we're not trying to invert things. But what we are trying to do is find the, the, the diamond in the rough. And it's like, just because the diamond is in the rough doesn't mean it's rough. You know, um, yeah. there's a, for anyone who hasn't read this, you owe it to yourself to go and read this short story called Lanington versus the Ants. It's a story set in colonial Brazil about an English farmer and his servants and he's the government the, the, the story opens up with the government coming to him and saying Lanington you have got to leave your property the army ants are coming and he says oh no I don't think I'll leave I've been here a long time I've, I've managed things okay I don't think a few ants are gonna bother me and the government says you don't understand they will kill you and every living thing on this property you have to leave and he says no I've got it covered. Trust me. And the government's like, okay, man. And they leave him alone. Uh, but he did understand exactly what was coming. And the battle between this farmer and some ants is like, it's like on par with the siege of Helm's Deep in Lord of the Rings in intensity. I'm, I'm not kidding. It's, it's fantastic. You can find it online. Lanington versus the ants. And it's like, that's that's not a story you would read in like the news or something, but it's a story that a creative artist could bring to the world if they're if they're going out and they're looking for and maybe they have a little bit of imagination to put some things together and some mm -hmm. create some hypothetical characters to to bring their notion of nobility to life. But um, it's it's about uh, yeah. All I'm trying to say is it's not about making the mundane transcendent or the hideous captivating it's about you know sifting through the mundane and the hideous in order to find the captivating the transcendent i like it i like it that's a good that's a good direction to go <laughs> i love that we got in trouble <laughs> from, from, from the solar battery <laughs> knock it on my door uh, Jack, we need to talk about your mouth. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, Reginald, but uh, we'll convert him yeah. yet. No, no, yeah, we'll we'll get him. Uh, already. Uh, but I guess that's an inside joke that nobody needs to know. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you would know uh, it if you were a member of the Order of Fire, uh, when yes. it first been. Uh, but anyway, uh, anyway, thanks everybody for, um, all the way along and uh and listening to this i think it turned out to be a, a great interesting talk uh, we weren't sure that was, where to go with it but it worked out um again obviously like and subscribe uh is what we have to, everybody has to say um yeah. and there is also the uh if you want to join our discord group you can talk about anything you want in there uh well except politics let's not do that but uh you, we can talk about uh, all kinds of stuff in there uh you can so learn the true like, identity of reginald Perhaps. Like to know. That's more like a Maybe. straight up order. You need to be actually one of the first. <laughs> but uh, but uh, well, let's see that. But uh, you know, to, to talk about uh, you know the ideas for the show, uh, we I, I poll uh, the people in the Greater Mandala, our, our our Discord group, uh, for 
you know, ideas for the show. And uh, we kind of bounce things off. Uh, some of this was based off of uh, some feedback I got today and also give them kind of some inside track. And, uh, and if you are interested in doing oil paintings of men lifting rocks, Jack has already promised to pay people in flats of gold monster for those paintings. So I thank you for that. that. <laughs> being discontinued uh, <laughs> but uh but no i mean i, I think it, it, that's an idea that's out there and that that, 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 that would be cool maybe like i said you do you could spend your rest of your life painting men right lifting rocks and it would be a good career uh you know just have to find the galleries to do the paintings you know? i need mean, to sell it you know and even that you could do elsewhere but but anyway guys thanks thank you for listening and uh thank you as always uh mr uh robertson for joining me and uh, go out and check out his many fine books. Pater is the cultural arm of the Order of Fire. For more, visit ph2t3.